Tonight on CBC Vancouver News, a mother's anguish, heart-wrenching testimony at the trial of a man accused of killing his daughters. Also, we are uh, actually very scared when I saw uh, two kids. A house fire in Surrey that critically injured two children is now being called suspicious and... This trove of documents suggests to me a, a fairly scary scenario. Allegations CSIS was spying on peaceful pipeline protesters in BC. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Emotional testimony in a Vancouver courtroom today from the mother of two girls found dead in their father's Oak Bay apartment on Christmas Day almost two years ago. Sarah Cotton detailed the hours leading up to the discovery of her daughter's bodies. The CBC's Jason Proctor was in the courtroom to hear her testimony today. So Jason, what else did Cotton tell the jury? Well, Mike, Sarah Cotton said she was supposed to get the kids at noon on that day, the two girls, Chloe and Aubrey. And what she described uh, in, in searing detail was basically the panic that set in afternoon as the minutes and then hours ticked by and there was no sign of the girls or her ex, Andrew Berry. She called him, she emailed him. At around two o'clock, uh, his parents came over. They were supposed to come over for Christmas dinner. She went with Andrew Berry's mother over to his house, she said. She knocked on the window, nothing. Ultimately, they went over to the police station, the Oak Bay police, uh, with a copy of the enforcement order, and the police said they would go and investigate. And she sort of said she, she basically couldn't speak at that point. She was so worried. Uh, the police turned up with his father, and she said she knew something was wrong. Uh, she said then that she was told to go in the chief's office, the chief of police. She goes in there. She describes basically having two female officers on either side of her, locking her tight into position. One of them said, Aubrey and Chloe have been injured. And she says she thought, well, at least they're alive. And then she says, one of the officers says, uh, Aubrey and Chloe are dead. The way she described it, she said, I screamed like never before. And I was in a, in a state of complete shock, as you can imagine. And, and at that point, uh, that was the testimony she gave about uh, the, the moments leading up to and the moment when she found out that her two girls are dead. And Andrew Berry, of course, is on trial right now, accused of second degree murder in their deaths. And Jason, how did the defense respond to Cotton's testimony? Well, Andrew Berry has pleaded not guilty uh, to the, the murders. And basically what happened in the afternoon, because as well as, as that moment, she had kind of, Sarah Cotton, had detailed a bit of the deterioration of their relationship. She sh sort of had said it, uh, up to that point, they were communicating only uh, to deal with kind of child arrangements, that kind of thing. And it was a strained relationship at, at, at best. Uh, she was kind of taken back through emails and texts in the time kind of leading up to that uh, through through to summer, basically, um, where the, the defense was trying to suggest that, in fact, they were dealing quite reasonably with arrangements and that they must have had some face to face conversations suggesting that, in, in fact, they were able to deal with each other fairly pleasantly. She is expected to be back on the stand uh, tomorrow uh, as cross-examination continues uh, in this trial. All right, Jason, thanks very much. Jason Proctor live in downtown Vancouver. Tonight. Two children remain in hospital in critical condition tonight after what police are now calling a suspicious house fire in Surrey. As the CBC's Andrea Ross reports, officers had been at the home before the fire, but it's not clear why. The fire broke out at this home in East Newton at about 10.30 yesterday morning. Firefighters rescued three people from the basement suite. We are uh, actually very scared when I saw uh, two kids. Kids are very serious. Fire guys give them uh, CPR. RCMP say both children and a parent were seriously injured. A fourth person was also taken to hospital, but it's not known if they were in the basement suite. The parent of the children was treated and released. We're currently on scene with uh, the Surrey Fire Services to decide what, uh, try and discern what the cause of the fire was. 
and hopefully we're able to get some uh, answers for these two kids who we they deserve better right we're trying to help them out police say they were called to the home yesterday before the fire but aren't saying why or if it was related to the fire the fire is now considered suspicious the cause has not been determined and no charges have been laid the neighborhood was quiet monday afternoon as rcmp and fire investigators parked out front but the smell of smoke was still apparent near the back of the house. It's not obvious a fire happened at the house behind me. There's not really any smoke damage that you can see, but yesterday smoke was pouring from the basement and it took 24 firefighters to put it out. It is obvious, however, that children live at this home. In the backyard, you can see strollers and children's toys, and two children were taken from the basement yesterday in critical condition. They remain in hospital and police remain here on scene investigating. Andrea Ross, CBC News, Surrey. Well, Uber and Lyft could finally be hitting BC streets by this September. Today, the province unveiled the final pieces of its ride-hailing puzzle. Our Leanne Young is here live with details tonight. So, Leanne, what did the province have to say? Well, Mike, in a call today with the Ministry of Transportation, MLA Bowen Ma, says ride-hailing companies can start applying for licenses from the province by September 3rd. ICBC is expected to be able to deliver ride-hailing specific insurance by that time. The Independent Passenger Transportation Board will be overseeing regulations for the industry. Now here are some of the main ones that drivers will have to follow. First of all, drivers will be subject to criminal and driver record checks. That comes with the requirement of having a Class 4 commercial driver's license. Cars must undergo periodic inspections anywhere from once every six months to a year. And a new ICBC policy is needed. We don't know at this point if it will cost more or less than regular taxi insurance. Now, we heard from Lyft today in response to today's announcement. They weren't exactly thrilled, calling it unnecessary red tape. They take issue with how drivers will be licensed. Part of that statement that they sent says this. Requiring commercial class 4 licenses for drivers will not improve safety, but will increase wait times and benefit the taxi industry. The province has said the class 4 is a non-negotiable for them in the name of passenger safety. Processing time for the applications is estimated to take anywhere from two months to two weeks, sorry, to a month. So we could see ride hailing in BC by as early as mid September. Mike? All right, we'll see what happens in the fall. Thanks, mm -hmm. Leah. You're welcome. The BC Civil Liberties Association says Canada's spy agency has overstepped its authority. Heavily censored documents allegedly show Canadian security intelligence agencies spied on environmentalists opposed to the now abandoned Northern Gateway Pipeline project. As Tanya Fletcher reports, the association wants the papers released in full. This all amounts to a shocking violation of free expression. The BC Civil Liberties Association has published more than 8,000 pages of heavily redacted documents. These protest papers, previously secret, appear to validate our original complaints against CSIS. That complaint was filed in 2014. It alleged CSIS unlawfully gathered intelligence on opponents of Enbridge's proposed Northern Gateway pipeline. But in 2017, the Security Intelligence Review Committee, which oversees CSIS, dismissed those allegations. Activists have now taken that decision to federal court. The documents the court ordered released reference a number of lobby groups by name. They also reveal 91 instances in 2013 alone where, quote, information was collected to assess the potential threat-related violence stemming from protests and demonstrations. In one example, environmental activists claimed their meeting in a church basement was being secretly monitored. Local citizens gathered to prepare to give testimony to the National Energy Board and paint protest signs. Uh, we later learned through freedom, a Freedom of Information request that that meeting had been infiltrated by the security services. Activists also claim CSIS has been sharing information with oil and gas companies. Now they want the unredacted documents released in full. Why are they redacted? What, what is being protected with that redaction? And perhaps even more importantly, who were they shared with? Um, who learned what about the members of our community? This former national security analyst says CSIS may well have acted legally. But this doesn't mean that CSIS engaged in a large surveillance operation. And in fact, uh, you know, they just might need to understand the different groups operating this space to say, you know, in fact, these groups aren't a threat. 
CISA says it did act within its mandate. It'll now be up to the federal court to determine whether any laws were broken. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. Meanwhile, environmental groups have filed a new legal challenge to the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. This one arguing that in okaying the project last month, Ottawa is not complying with its responsibility to protect southern resident killer whales. Ecojustice is representing Raincoast Conservation Foundation and Living Ocean Society in trying to appeal the approval. The Tsleil-Waututh First Nation is expected to file a similar motion. The groups have had success in this arena before. It was their challenge that convinced the Federal Court of Appeal to overturn the project's initial approval last summer. Well, for a second time, the RCMP has reached a financial settlement with women who were discriminated against by the force. The latest agreement applies to female contractors, municipal staff, and volunteers who worked with the Mounties starting in September 1974. Compensation ranges between $10,000 and $220,000, depending on the circumstances. The law firm expects around 1,500 claims to be made, bringing the value of the class action to around $100 million. Well, it's ultimately for the assess an assessor to determine what level of compensation a claimant will be entitled to, if any, um, the more severe the harm and the impact on the woman, the higher the compensation. In a statement, RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky said she's pleased with the settlement and apologized to the plaintiffs for the pain caused to them and their families. She went on to say that harassment and discrimination do not have a place in the RCMP. An earlier class action settlement was reached for female RCMP officers. It was also valued at $100 million. A convicted murderer and another man convicted of robbery and assault have escaped from a prison and are at large tonight. A massive search effort kicked off today after the pair was nowhere to be found during a prisoner count last night at William Head Institution just southwest of Victoria. Despite the list of convictions held by the two men, reaction from the community was mixed. You don't want to be um, walking around in the evening at, by yourself. And you just have to be alert. It doesn't particularly bother me. I'm armed. James Bush is described as 42 years old, 5'9", 179 pounds, medium tan skin, a shaved head, and a skull tattoo on his left arm. Zachary Armitage is described as 30 years old, 5'10", 170 pounds. He's of First Nations descent with light skin, short black hair, and a crown tattoo on his right arm that also reads, No Love. West Shore RCMP say the two are dangerous and should not be approached. Now, the University of British Columbia will not be allowed to participate in the Vancouver Pride Parade this year after it allowed a controversial speaker to rent a room on campus. Jen Smith gave a speech criticizing the province's sexual education curriculum back in June. The event was protested but ultimately went ahead. Vancouver Pride Society says it rescinded UBC's entry into the parade because of the decision to provide a platform for transphobic hate speech. Participating in the Pride Parade isn't a right, it's a, it's a privilege, and that um, organizations need to be walking the walk, um, not just talking the talk around uh, trans inclusion, around queer inclusion um, within their organization and out, out in the world in general. In a statement, UBC says it is aware of the impact the June event had on members of the community and that it's committed to ensuring marginalized voices are heard and the university remains a respectful environment for everyone. The Pride Society will provide space for UBC students, faculty, and employees who wish to do so as individuals. A man missing for five days after going for a hike on Vancouver Island has been found alive. 50-year-old Murray Naswell had last been seen going for a hike in Strathcona Provincial Park. Rescuers found him by a helicopter at a cabin. Teams hadn't been able to find him earlier due to poor flying conditions. He did all the right things. He stayed put. He made himself a fire. He made himself comfortable. He dried out his clothes and he did everything right. He just happened to get into fog and got a little bit mixed up about coming down. RCMP officers with dogs, rescue teams from across Vancouver Island, and even Chilliwack and Pemberton were called in to help with the search.
BC forestry workers are feeling the effects of a shrinking industry tonight. And work reductions recently announced at two Prince George sawmills are just the latest example. Permanent closures, job cuts, or reduced shifts will affect more than 20 sawmills across the province this summer. Between them, hundreds have lost jobs and thousands of lost work hours. The downturn is being blamed on factors like poor market conditions, wildfires, and invasive pine beetles. Another gray whale has been found dead on BC's coast, this time in Haida Gwaii. The almost 10 meter long animal was found last week on North Beach, not far from the village of Masset. A provincial veterinarian performed a full necropsy on the animal Saturday, but couldn't find an obvious cause of death. Samples from the whale will be examined for more clues over the coming months. So far, eight gray whales have been found dead on BC shores and dozens more along the western coast of North America. Scientists are trying to get up to the bottom of what's causing the mass die-off. U.S. officials say many of the dead whales were found to be malnourished. All right, time for our first check of the forecast. Brett is here, and it turned out to be a pretty nice day out there. You know, I would say so. It kind of maybe makes you feel like dancing a little bit. I don't know if you can tell, but right behind me, there's some people really giving it right now. It is a free summer dance series that occurs every Monday, 5 to 6 p.m. This is at the Queen Elizabeth Theatre, and I can't help but, like, want to bounce around to some of this music. There's some good vibes. The sun is shining. It feels nice out here. This is summer when we think about it. Wanted to show you what our current temperatures are right now across the region. In general, this is right where we should be. Temperatures, 19, 20 degrees, a little bit warmer, say Pitt Meadows toward Abbotsford. But this is great. As I said, kind of just feeling these summer vibes. And this is going to be continuing for the next 24 hours or so. Worth mentioning, though, we don't have a lot on the satellite and radar imagery right now around us. And that's why, well, it's largely so sunny. But elsewhere in the province, it is worth mentioning we have two separate things to be worrying about. First of all, we have a severe thunderstorm watch right now for a lot of the interior portions of BC. And in fact, this just in, not too long ago, we found out that there has been a flood warning issued actually for the Chilcotin River south of Big River. So that's going to be on the west, right around Highway 20 there where you can see it. Um, and then far to the north as well, we've actually been dealing with a lot of lightning strikes into the region. This has ignited about nine fires in the far northwest where the fire danger rating is quite high. So this is going to be something that we're going to be keeping a close eye on over the next few days. All right, Brett, thank you very much. We You're will welcome. talk to you a little bit later. Sounds good. Well, TransLink is trying out an on-demand bus service that will allow users to choose, pick up, and drop off locations with an app. And it all begins next week on Bowen Island. The new model is meant to give users flexible transportation options in addition to traditional bus service on high traffic routes. I'm eager to see what we learn through this process and thoroughly explore how transit on demand potentially can be adapted for wider use not only here on Bowen Island but through, throughout Metro Vancouver. The pilot project runs on Bowen until mid-September. Well, just a reminder, you can also watch CBC Vancouver News at 6 on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. And if you're watching us right now on Facebook or YouTube, we're also going to be live during the upcoming commercial break. Well, it left his parents speechless. A 25-year-old man giving up a good job to play video games. Find out why his dream might not be as crazy as you think. Coming up. Big celebration to let everyone three to open up in Vancouver, and Deer wants to go even greener by recycling old weed containers. The packaging is made of some pretty serious plastic, and having that go into your normal recycling bin could lead it to going into a landfill, which in 2019 is pretty crazy. You have to kind of press down to open, but. Uh, it's basically just a, a, very, a safety sealed plastic container. Cannabis containers are supposed to be heavily sealed and childproof by federal law. That makes them hard to recycle. Customers don't always know what to do with old packaging. 
you actually can't return your container and they're like metal proper packaging. So it's like it's hard, annoying that you can't recycle it. But Deer has ordered a special recycling bin for this store. It's part of the Tweed and TerraCycle program, a nationwide service that upcycles old cannabis products. They then take the packages, which is very cool, and they melt them down into small plastic pellets, and they use those pellets to do things like build prosthetic limbs, things like that. So it's a very cool way to make sure that the product is safe from the producer and that it can actually get back to that producer or get reused and repurposed in a better way. The only problem? The province doesn't allow used containers inside dispensaries because they're unsealed. The province considers that an open container and you're not allowed to have open containers in the store. Deer fears he could face fines for accepting old packaging. He says a provincial inspector told him not to set up the bin inside the store, but he plans to do it anyways. We'll have it in the store and we're going to try to we're going to try to recycle as many containers as we can. Deer hopes the move could sway regulations to be more lenient. CBC News reached out to the province for a comment, but did not hear back. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. And speaking of all things green in terms of businesses, we're going to have a look at how one BC company is working to make the shipping industry more environmentally friendly. That's coming up next. In the meantime, have a look at these great live shots of downtown Vancouver from our live camera. A major polluter is slowly going green. Worldwide, shipping spews out about 940 million tons of carbon dioxide every year. That's about 2.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. The CBC's Greg Rasmussen takes a look at one solution and the BC companies leading the way. On the surface, it's like many of the vessels working the BC coast, moving freight, delivering Canadian cargo. Yeah, very modern. But below decks, it's not your normal oil-burning engine. This is the battery room. Wow, okay, that's a lot of batteries. Yeah, a lot of batteries. The Reliant is a hybrid, partly powered by electricity, much like a Toyota Prius. As with many different modes of transportation now, we're seeing electrification. Um, so in this case, we have diesel engines combined with batteries. Uh, and it's definitely the way of the future. The battery system is Canadian, in use now on 200 vessels around the world. Business has spiked recently, driven by the need to reduce emissions. When you're building a new vessel, you want it to last for, say, 30 years. You don't want to adopt a technology that's kind of on the margin in terms of obsolescence. You want to build that to sort of be future-proof. A future where the shipping industry is being forced to cut back on this, smokestack emissions. Worldwide, the industry pumps out 940 million tons of CO2, nearly 3% of the global total. Scandinavia is leading the world with electric ships. These ferries are completely battery powered, recharged between sailings. Now yeah, we're in the wheelhouse of the C-SPAN Reliant. After three years of daily use hauling freight along BC's coast, C-SPAN's Harley Penner is a big believer in the hybrid technology and its ability to cut CO2. What we're able to do is, in certain instances, reduce the amount of engines that we have running. And when you're reducing the amount of engines that you have running, you're reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. Driving it all, new international regulations forcing the shipping industry to reduce emissions. At the same time, pressures building from customers, such as Mountain Equipment Co-op, which closely tracks its environmental footprint. You're hearing more and more companies build it into their DNA in terms of how they do business, and that's really cool to see. It's not just NBC anymore really trying to do this. There's a lot of partners out there also. A new way to provide emission-free transport from... In the global race to cut emissions, all kinds of options are on the table, even giant kites to harvest wind power at sea. 
But in practical terms, hybrids like these BC boats, and in the future, pure electrics, are likely to play a larger role in keeping the propellers turning. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Delta, BC. There has been plenty of fighting over fish here in BC, but in Manitoba, a similar fight exists. It surrounds the stock of walleye in Lake Winnipeg, known in most of Canada as pickerel. The province fears they are in danger, but as Bartley Kivas reports, commercial fishermen disagree. Commercial fishers all over Lake Winnipeg say there are plenty of walleye in this inland sea. Scientists and regulators don't share that sunny outlook. Off the shore of Hecla Island, Einar Svensson hauls fish out of Lake Winnipeg. It's near the end of the commercial fishing season, and the nets, he says, have been full. This season has been terrific, you know. Very happy with the way this season turned out, and it's been terrific, like I say, for the last 10 years. Einar is the fourth generation of Svensons to fish the lake. The most important catch is walleye. The province fears the stock is in danger. It's buying back commercial quotas and increasing the mesh size on gill nets so smaller fish can go free. Since a peak of about 2008 and 2009, the catch has steadily declined for the fishers, and I think angling success has also declined. University of Winnipeg biologist Scott Forbes says the province needs to do even more. If we keep doing what we're doing, um, uh, we'll, we'll um, drive the population into collapse as it was driven into collapse in the late 1960s. The fishers don't agree. They don't trust the biologists, and they've hired their own scientists to combat what they call misinformation about walleye stocks. It's like anything else. If you put it in the paper enough times, then people will start to believe it, correct? The commercial fishers say they'll go public with their own evidence. In the meantime, the province is planning to buy back more quotas. In the classic fishtail, an angler exaggerates the size of a single catch. On the scale of Lake Winnipeg, it's a much more complex question about the size of the walleye stocks beneath the surface of the world's 11th largest body of fresh water. Bartley Kivas, CBC News, at Hecla Village in Manitoba. It is a controversial technique that promises to set gay people straight. While Alberta has waffled in its promise to ban the so-called therapy, one city is promising to take action. We'll take you there next.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Emotional testimony in BC Supreme Court today from the mother of two little girls found dead on Christmas Day in 2017 in Victoria. Their father, Andrew Berry, is charged with second degree murder. He has pleaded not guilty. Sarah Cotton told the court she screamed like never before and told her children were dead. There was one incident earlier up the day at the home. I'm not able to talk more about that this time. Investigators are now calling a house fire in Surrey that left two children in critical condition suspicious. Officers had been at the home before the fire, but it's not clear why. There was an ongoing campaign to spy against the opponents of pipelines in this country. The BC Civil Liberties Association says Canada's spy agency overstepped its authority. Heavily censored documents allegedly show the Canadian Security Intelligence Agency spied on environmentalists opposed to the now abandoned Northern Gateway Pipeline project. Well, it's a hot button issue in Alberta, conversion therapy. The United Conservative government says it does not condone the practice, but while a handful of provinces have banned it outright, as Rafi Bujakanian explains, frustration that Alberta hasn't is prompting one Alberta city to take its own stand. I wish I'd come out when I was like a teenager. Kevin Schultz spent a long time struggling with his identity as a gay man. More than a decade ago, he signed up with a church group hoping he'd emerge straight after seeing counselors. The bottom line message that they gave was that we were broken, that because of our sexuality, um, we were broken people before God. We, they, they taught us that nobody is born gay. It took a lot for Schultz to leave. What made his decision was when another participant experienced a psychotic break and then the only advice he received was to pray. I remember leaving the, the group that night and having no idea what I'd do next because I'd never been a part of the gay community. I didn't know where to find it. And this is the right thing to do. Today, the city of St. Albert took its own step, passed a motion ordering its committees looking into banning conversion therapy. We're the ones that can make a difference today, and that's, that's always been our role. Uh, municipalities have a long history of making these kind of value statements. Despite ever-growing support for LGBTQ communities in cities across Canada, so far it's been largely up to higher levels of government to come up with policies banning conversion therapy. Our government established a working group to figure out the best way to ban this practice altogether. In Alberta, the previous NDP government was looking into it, but the new United Conservative government stopped funding efforts and won't say why. Our position on that is exactly the same as, as the NDP's was. They were in office for four years, uh, and uh, so our position is the same as the NDP's. It's frustration with that position and the passing of Bill 8 that prompted the St. Albert campaign. St. Albert um, could actually lend a small voice towards a bigger voice to the elimination of it. And other municipalities are listening. Some Calgary councillors are suggesting they may study a similar motion and Edmonton's looking into it too. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, St. Albert. 6.34 on this Monday evening. There's a live look uh, across the street at the Queen Elizabeth Plaza. Some Zumba dancing going on there. Got some pretty good moves. Nice night for that. Turned out to be a pretty nice day on the South Coast. But will it last? Brett's forecast coming next.
While quitting the nine to five job routine to play video games full time is something many people might dream about, Landon Trybuck decided to stop dreaming. He quit his $75,000 a year software development gig to pursue esports. That's competitive professional video game playing. We caught up with Landon to find out how it was going. For any parent to hear that their kid has taken all this education and all this stuff that, you know, they were kind of like raised to do the normal correct career path and then just deciding, no, I want to play video games, it sounds terrible. So like, I don't blame my family at all for being very skeptical of it. It was, are you sure that this is like a real career? I'm Landon Trybuck, I go by Captain L. I'm a Super Smash Brothers player with the gaming stadium. I was ranked number two in Canada, and I peaked at number 36 in the world, and I do this for a living. The one misconception that I absolutely hate about esports is that the only reason we do this is because we're lazy and don't want to have a real job and just play video games all day, and that, that to me couldn't be farther from the truth. Like, it is fun and rewarding, but it's also stressful, and there's so much meaning placed on it, and it's very important to me how I perform. I, I really do consider myself an athlete because when we come together for that head-to-head, -head, that's just kind of a culmination of all the work that we've both put into this to see who can really come out on top. And it's that competitive spirit that I think really defines me as an athlete. Every, every pro gamer's situation is a little bit different, like where they get money from and stuff. Like standard sources are sponsors often give a salary, a lot of people make money from YouTube revenue, a lot of people make money from Twitch revenue, and sometimes, inconsistently, you can make money from winning tournaments, though generally you don't want to, you know, have your rent money riding on whether or not you beat a, a couple people, right? The, the hardest choice that I had to make was whether or not to continue trying to balance a traditional software job with an uh, esports career. So I took a leap of faith, I left my software job, and it's been a lot of stress, all but good, good. I, I definitely Bye. wouldn't trade the experience for anything. I've absolutely loved every moment of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, what is gaming giving me in life? Oh, it's giving me so much. Um, pretty much my entire friend group is who I've met through Smash Bros. And just honestly finding my way as an independent person because, you know, ever since I've been like 21 and stuff, I've been just like taking airplanes across the continent and stuff. It's actually crazy, like how if you want to be a professional gamer, you pretty much have to grow up real quick. My plans are definitely to continue practicing as much as I can and competing. And even if I don't eventually reach that best in the world status, I definitely want to be someone, if not, if not the best player, at least someone that people can look up to and think, you know, he did a good job. I, I, wanna, I wanna succeed like he did. Well, number two in Canada. I mean, that is pretty impressive. Is Have pretty you ever impressive. played Smash Bros before? No. No, it's no. actually a lot harder than it looks. Yeah. I'll be honest, I was never very good at it. My brother can actually beat me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, NHL, EA, EA Sports. Oh, yeah, yeah. The problem for me is the controller. Right. I could never figure out which button to press. I know. Good it's tough out there. But yeah, seriously. Yeah. Captain L. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, you've pressed some of uh, the right buttons today because I think what, a, so. what a beauty. It worked out to be really nice. I mean, we haven't seen the sun in seemingly a long time, so I personally was excited to get out and enjoy it. But everything must come to an end. As quickly as it began, there is going to be some rain on the forecast. I'm going to let you know about that. But let's take a look and see what the day started off as across the region. Region. I would say this was actually a pretty nice way to start. Just a few little clouds, then look at that sunrise. A few clouds lingered throughout bits of the morning, but then by the early afternoon, it was bright, it was just like that, flashes of light, and I think everyone's mood kind of improved with that. I mean, I was just out there, you heard me kind of moving along to so the dancing that was going on. I feel like it's the summer vibe time. It is the first week of July. This is what we would be hoping for. But as I said, we do have a little bit of rain to deal with, and I want to let you know where that's going to be coming from. So widespread, first of all, rain is coming from the north to the south, impacting, say, toward Prince George. But the one that we're going to be watching is really the rain that's going to be coming up from the south, rather the southwest to the northeast. This is going to be happening late Tuesday night, getting into Wednesday. So for Tuesday, as far as it's concerned, it's not going to be too shabby of a day, maybe a little bit more cloud than we'd like. But overall, it is going to be dry. And to zoom in on what we can be expecting, really, when this is going to be going on, you're going to notice a lot of cloud cover in the early afternoon, then very widespread all throughout Tuesday overnight and lasting into Wednesday. 
say, we're going to be getting some decent accumulating rain. Now, I checked Vancouver so far has just about six millimeters of rain at the airport, and we normally for July would be getting close to about 36 millimeters of rain. And with this, over the next 24 to 48 hours, we could potentially be getting anywhere between 5 to 10 to 15 millimeters of rain across much of the lower mainland and, of course, a little bit higher over our North Shore mountains. Now, this is doing great wonders for our southern regions in terms of our fire danger rating, but still worth mentioning, as I said, fire danger rating to the northwest is quite high, and there have been quite a few fires sparking up in that region. In terms of our seven, five day rather, looking ahead to the next few days, temperatures are going to be pretty nice, hovering right around 23 degrees. A little bit cooler when we get into some of that rain, as I mentioned, for Tuesday night and into Wednesday, but already a sneak peek ahead into next weekend, and this is looking quite nice. Now, I know it's far away, but I'm feeling I'm feeling comfortable about this one. I think ahead. it's going to be good. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. There you go. Right, Thanks very much. You're welcome. Well, high-profile U.S. financier Jeffrey Epstein has been charged with sex trafficking. He's accused of paying girls as young as 14 for sex. Find out why he didn't get bail right after the break. I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Your favorite summer tradition is back. Musical Nooners is back for its 10th year, so grab a lunch and a friend and enjoy free concerts weekdays at noon all summer long. And join us at the Surrey Fusion Festival on July 20th to 21st at Holland Park. Swing by our tent for fun and prizes and meet CBC Vancouver's Anita Bath and Michelle Elliott. For more on these events, check us out online. High-profile U.S. financier Jeffrey Epstein has been charged with sex trafficking. He's in police custody in New York tonight, accused of paying girls as young as 14 for sex. As the CBC's Kim Brunhuber explains, officials outlined the allegations against him this morning. The alleged behavior shocks the conscience. Jeffrey Epstein is accused of running a sex trafficking network as complex and well-organized as it is disturbing. A sexual pyramid scheme involving recruiters from around the world assigned to lure girls as young as 14. As a 16-year-old, Virginia Roberts was working at Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago resort in Palm Beach when she says she was recruited to be a masseuse for Epstein. 
it ended with sexual abuse and intercourse and then a pat on the back. You've done a really good job. Here's $200. Victims say they were offered money to recruit others. I'm really, really sad that I brought other girls my age and even younger into a world that they should have never been introduced to. And now, possibly new evidence seized from Epstein's $56 million home in New York. Evidence including uh, nude photographs of what appear to be underage girls. These photographs were labeled and locked in a safe. The case is attracting even more attention because Epstein had faced federal indictments for these alleged crimes in Florida more than a decade ago. But he struck a plea deal on lesser state charges and served only 13 months in jail. The prosecutor behind the deal? Alexander Acosta, then the United States attorney in Miami, now Donald Trump's labor secretary. Trump has long been connected to the multimillionaire, saying in 2002, he's a lot of fun to be with. It is even said that he likes beautiful women as much as I do, and many of them are on the younger side. Legal experts say it's possible some of Epstein's powerful acquaintances could be investigated too. Are they gonna go after President Trump? Are they gonna go after some other elected official who was part of Mr. Epstein's misconduct? Who knows? Prosecutors say they've spoken to more victims and are asking for anyone with information about the alleged crimes to come forward. My office will not rest until perpetrators of these types of crimes are brought to justice. Victims' voices, including the many voices of Epstein's alleged victims, must be heard. Given the number of people allegedly involved, it's likely this investigation could unearth even more victims and possibly more suspects. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. Canada's premiers are meeting for the last time before the upcoming federal election. But a day ahead of that meeting, Alberta's Jason Kenney hosted his own. And as Carolyn Dunn tells us, only a select group of premiers was invited. Howdy, folks. Are you having a good stampede? Nothing like pancakes and politics to draw a crowd, especially during Stampede. Alberta's Jason Kenney invited those he called like-minded premiers to be part of his Stampede Breakfast Club. As gifts, the conservative-leaning leaders got traditional white hats and belt buckles. This is not about parties, this is uh, about prosperity. And those who have the same ideas about how to achieve it on issues like resource development, pipelines, interprovincial trade, and the federal carbon tax. Despite two recent provincial court losses, the Premier say that legal battle isn't over yet. We are going to come together um, <sighs> with, our, with our ministers of justice in the, in the weeks ahead to ensure that we are going to be putting forward the best presentation to the, to the Supreme Court. But today's political show of force is also about winning over public sentiment to use as leverage to sway the Trudeau government, especially with a federal election looming. My hope is that the current federal government returns to its initial promise of a cooperative approach to federalism. Um, none of us, nor do our citizens, appreciate a message that it's either Ottawa's way or the highway. There's this will by the current government to just tax people more and think it'll get better because everyone will feel like I'm, I'm playing a, a guilty tax here. But tomorrow in Saskatoon, when this group of five becomes 13 provincial and territorial leaders, they won't all be singing from the same songbook. On many subjects, we'll be all together, but on other ones, like the pipeline, we won't be uh, in line. Yeah! So the Pancake Summit attendees have every motivation to shout out their position. Like-minded premiers flexing political muscle to try to convince those who may not be so like-minded they've got the sizzle to fight Ottawa and win. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. U.S. President Donald Trump devoted an entire speech today to a subject he rarely talks about, the environment. Trump touted a range of policies he says have made the U.S. a world environmental leader. But as Stephen D'Souza tells us, for some, his list of achievements is a tough sell. The speech was billed as America's environmental leadership. It might as well have been called Make America Clean Again. We want the cleanest air. We want crystal clean water. Donald Trump boasted of his administration's accomplishments cleaning up toxic sites, America's top ranking in access to clean drinking water, 
and declining air pollution. We're doing a very tough job and not everybody knows it. It's so damaging that there almost aren't words uh, to capture um, how it will play out. A three, three. But for a president who has denied his own scientist claims about climate change, critics say his words ring hollow. I would say that is comical if his policies weren't so dangerous. Uh, I've often said that his policies, both around in air pollution and water pollution, should actually come with a label, uh, almost like cigarettes, that says that this policy is dangerous for your health. From pulling out of the Paris Climate Accord, to weakening vehicle emission rules, to eliminating dozens of regulations meant to protect the environment, Ali says Trump is taking the country backwards. They have not moved forward on one piece of legislation that has actually helped to protect people's lives. He says even Trump's own pronouncements about clean air are undercut by his support for the coal industry. We're gonna have clean coal, really clean coal. Today's speech, however, may have been more about the political climate. Polls show Trump ranks far behind Democrats on environmental issues. We have only one America. We have only one planet. But while he talked about air and water quality, there was little mention of reducing emissions to address rising global temperatures, the crux of the climate change crisis. The president often does this apples and oranges types of thing just to confuse folks. In fact, while he talked a lot about how a strong economy is good for the environment, President Trump never once mentioned climate change in his speech. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Washington. Europe is struggling tonight to respond to an increase in Iran's stockpile of enriched uranium. It now exceeds the 300 kilo limit set in the 2015 nuclear agreement with world powers. We have called uh, on Iran to uh, not to take further measures that undermine the nuclear deal, and we now strongly urge Iran to stop and reverse all activities that are inconsistent uh, with the commitments made. Iran confirms it has surpassed the agreed-to purity level of 3.67% enrichment and now reached 4.5%. It's still well below the 90% level needed for weapons-grade levels of uranium enrichment. But Tehran has signaled it will go further by September unless world powers convince the U.S. to ease sanctions and come back to the table. The Trump administration imposed sanctions on Iran after abruptly withdrawing from the pact last year. The EU, China, and Russia have all been critical to the U.S. for pulling out of that deal. Well, it's a unique school that has fathers doing twists and turns. We'll take you to hair school for dads next.
Well, a school with campuses across the country has created a popular one-day program that comes with a twist. MC College invites fathers to bring in their daughters for an afternoon tangled in what some might call a hairy experience. Here's a look. He, um, he's doing a French braid and pigtails right now. This is our third year now for dads to come and learn how to do their daughter's hair or single moms, anybody really to come and learn how to do their children's hair. There's so much things to bond with the with, with son, but there's not much to do with, with the daughter. I figured that nowadays everybody's equal, so it's important that we as males and females show that so that it's okay that we can do hair just as well as a mom does. Kind of a nice time in the morning with, uh, with my daughter to do her hair. You get a chance to talk with her a bit, just you and her. To learn how to do my sister's hair. Well, I've learned that there's different types of combs and you can make your hair, their, their hair very smooth. What do you think about your dad helping do your hair now? Uh, I like it. Good job there, Dad. Way to go. And uh, speaking of things to do with your kids, why not take them to a free outdoor concert? Yeah, held every day at our studios in Vancouver on 700 Hamilton Street. Today's guests brought lots of fun for children. Juno Award nominee Will's Jams had kids jumping around on our plaza. The rest of this week's artists bring in a eclectic mix. Tariq is going to join us on the plaza tomorrow. On Wednesday, we'll have the Latin grooves of Mazacote. Local band Rare Americans brings their flavor of punk music to the stage. And to close the week, we'll have Trailer Hawks blend of country and rock and roll. Now, while the weather was good today, be sure to follow at CBC Vancouver for any updates and schedule changes, just in case the weather takes Big crowd out there today, lots of fun. Hopefully we'll see you uh, out there tomorrow or sometime during the week. They go on all summer at, uh, at noon on our plaza. Well, you can always find our news program online at cbc.ca slash bc. Our next local news is right here at 11 with Leon Young right after the National. Have a great night.